Hello. Sohan, can we start? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. Sohan is here. Yeah, I've just reached home. <laughs> Are we good to go now, sir? Good evening. Good evening, sir. Hi. Yes. So, can we start, sir? Yeah, yeah. Can we? Okay. 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 Let's start. So good evening and welcome to one and all. Second thing is that we must pick up on planet. Planet is very small to be a part of this webinar, the future partner. Now I would like to present to you all a short picture of planet. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your patience. Planet in India's largest life insurance agency and doctor certificate medical content platform. Our website is www.planet.com, where we have lots of live sessions conducted by Indian speakers across the globe. And we have mentioned services in this medical agency here for doctors only that also can be in a later time. We invite all the doctors to visit our website. Now, without any further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Sohan Swaran. So, over to you, Sohan. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And uh, on behalf of SOPSI, I welcome you all uh, for this uh, <coughs> SOPSI <coughs> webinar series. 
and today we have uh, like uh, very experienced Dr. Vibhavari Nayak with us and a very young uh, faculty and uh, from Hyderabad, uh, Dr. Shavvi Adda. And Dr. Shavvi Adda is consultant in Indo-American Hospital uh, along with uh, Dr. Vibhavari Nayak. So Dr. Viba is a, a very senior faculty in Indo-American Hospital uh, Hyderabad. And uh, so they will be like speaking on the this pre-op optimization of labial oncosurgery, so how this will go ahead for the optimization. So I will hand over this session to Dr. Vibhavari Nayak. Uh, Dr. Viba, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Sohan. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to the next webinar of SOAPC, which is sixth in this series. I thank the academic team for making me chairperson for this webinar. And while most of you are SOAPC members, I know a few of you who've joined in today are not SOAPC members. So if you are doing substantial onco work, Please join in SOPSI, become a member, because SOPSI has been conducting these academic events very regularly, and they will be enriching. And you will not miss any notification of the academic event by SOPSI. Now coming to today's topic. As quoted by Aristotle, well begun is half done. And so is true for preoperative evaluation and optimization for patients coming for cancer surgeries. Well, there isn't much difference between non-cancer patients coming for non-cancer surgeries, though there are some stark differences that we as anesthesiologists need to be aware of. And that is going to be the focus of discussion today. For this, I proudly invite Dr. Sravya Adda, who's working as a consultant with us in Basav Tarakam Indo-American Cancer Hospital and Research Institute. Dr. Sravya has done her fellowship in onco-anesthesia and critical care and pain. And she's also done her certificate course in essentials of palliative care. Though her CV looks modest, Dr. Sravya is a meticulous and a compassionate anesthesiologist. She loves to teach and she is loved by her fellows. With this, I hand over to Dr. Stavya. Over to you, Stavya. Sharing my slides. Good evening, everyone. Uh, greetings from Basvat Arakam Indo-American Cancer Hospital. This is Dr. Shravya today, and I will be talking about preoperative optimization of comorbidities in a time-sensitive oncosurgery. Today, we will be going through uh, what are uh, time-sensitive surgeries, this, if there's a need for optimization, and system-wise optimization. As, a peri uh, as we all know that now anesthesiologists lead peri are lead perioperative physicians, and we, as a perioperative physician, should be uh, well known with the unique set of challenges a cancer patient can pose with us. The, uh, the timing of the cancer surgeries can affect the perioperative outcome. Though rarely an emergency, cancer surgeries are not truly elective. The amount of time available for the optimization of these surgeries are limited, making them a time-sensitive surgery. What is the definition of a time-sensitive surgery? According to 2014 ACC AHA guidelines, uh, they describe time-sensitive surgery as a surgery if there is a less, delay of less than one to six weeks for further evaluation, it would not negatively affect the outcome. So what makes our oncological procedures time-sensitive? Firstly, the tumor growth. 
few tumors are very aggressive in nature, so they have to be addressed faster. That makes them very time sensitive. If at all they are not addressed in the uh, uh, addressed in the initial phase phases, the stage of the cancer can upregulate, and that will again causes uh, issues with the optimal survival. Health of the patient is always better to be addressed in the initial stages of the cancer because as the uh, advancement of the cancer is there, the echo performance score of the patient also deteriorates. That will make it more difficult to address. Coming to return to the intended oncological treatment, we need to remember that the surgery is just one aspect of the whole treatment for the patient. There includes chemotherapy, radiation. So earlier the patient, uh, the surgery, earlier the surgery of the patient is done, uh, we can start the rehabilitation will be faster. The patient can further then go for adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation. All this makes it a time sensitive and also time to the surgery very important. Time to surgery is a very cons budding concept that is now coming up, which basically talks about the optimal time interval from the diagnosis to the surgery or from the new adjuvant chemo or radiation therapy to the time of the surgery. There are a few articles that are seen with breast cancer surgeries where they have two groups, uh, they have taken two groups of patients, one with who have uh, had neoadjuvant chemotherapy and one who have were posted directly for the primary surgery. It showed that a delay of more than eight weeks reduced the survival, but we have eight weeks for optimization. At the same time, the similar uh, studies were conducted on head and neck cancer that mainly focused on prevent time from diagnosis to the primary surgery, which gave about 67 days. And in esophagectomies also, the time, uh, if it is advised that a delay of eight weeks would give better margins after chemo radiation. Why don't we need to pre-optimize these patients? Apart from the physical, metabolic, emotional, and systemic impacts that the cancer pose on a patient, we, it is also compounded by effects that age, frailty, comorbidities, and cancer treatment. All these things together make the patient a deconditioned patient due to the multiple hit hypothesis on them. This will make us it very important for pre-optimization. We have already discussed on the concept of prehabilitation in our previous class with Dr. Nishkar, sir. Prehabilitation is defined as a process of improving the functional capability of a patient prior to the surgical procedure so that the patient can withstand post-operative inactivity and associated decline with it. Studies have shown the patient who have been rehabilitated had reduced ICU stay, earlier discharge, and good improved quality of life and good functional status. Overall, better outcomes were seen in these patients. They focus on four components in prehabilitation, that is nutrition, exercise, optimization of comorbidities, uh, and also addressing stress and anxiety reduction. Today in this class, I will be mainly speaking about optimization of these comorbidities and going further. We, firstly, we need to see the risk stratification. There are several surgical risk stratification calculators available, one by American College of Surgeons, that is NSQIP, and also that which is mainly used in the United States, and other is the surgical outcome risk tool, SORT, that is mainly used in UK. All these stratification scores have not been studied in the Indian population. That makes it a limitation for us, but we can always use these guides to see if at all there is any comparison. Most studies, if at all, come up that will assess on the Indian population, that will be very helpful. So coming to the stepwise optimization of these procedures, st I'll start with the cardiovascular system. We all know that the cardiovascular complications account up to the major part, that is 45% of overall deaths in the patient within 30 days of a major surgery. This is further influenced by if at all the patient is optimized or there is any presence of specific comorbidities, complexity of the surgery that is planned, and the urgency of the surgery. We should also remember that there are special risks that is implied to a cancer and cancer treatment on the patient. So cancer patients have to be specifically assessed for the cardiovascular system. So what makes our oncological patients high risk for the cardiac complications? 
Firstly, they are elderly patients with reduced cardiac reserve. Lifestyle factors also impacts them. They have history of smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, all of which impose to the pre-existing cardiovascular disorders in terms of hypertension, coronary artery disease, and atherosclerosis. There are also metabolic disorders very commonly seen, that is dyslipidemia and diabetes mellitus. And finally, since it's a discussion on the cancer patients, cancer treatment and implications of chemotherapy and radiation also have an impact on the cardiac complications. So talking about chemotherapeutic cardiotoxicity, uh, patients who have been subjected to the chemotherapy have various health hypotheses where we can see different types of cancer-induced uh, cardiotoxicity, type 1 coming with anthracyclines, mainly used in breast cancer surgeries, uh, which is an irreversible cardiotoxicity, type 2 with tratsumab, which is uh, used again in uh, breast cancer, and but the type 2 chemotherapeutic cardiotoxicities are reversible cardiotoxicity. Type 3 are myocardial ischemias, uh, mainly seen with 5-fluorouracil and capsitabine. And finally, speaking about radiation therapy also has an impact on the heart, call, causing uh, myocellular injury and finally left ventricular remodel. Other drugs such as bevacizumab, which are angiogenesis inhibitors, also tend to have impact. That will, so this, these patients can pose with newly diagnosed hypertension, which was not present before. And most of these chemotherapeutic drugs cause QT prolongation leading to arrhythmias. These cardiotoxicities can manifest from subacute from days to months and eventually can manifest it, uh, in the span of years into clinical heart failure. So this has to be assessed in long term. How do you stratify the cardiac risk in these patients? According to the type of surgery given by 2014 ACC guidelines, uh, risk stratification is based upon high, uh, high risk, intermediate, and low risk. Most of the procedures, uh, oncological surgeries, are majorly come under high to intermediate risk factors, so we have to be very cautious with them. Patient risk stratification is also important, which can be done with help of revised cardiac risk indices in which they have different components such as high-risk surgery, patient with ischemic heart diseases, patient with congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, and creatinine. They have been given points, have been assigned, and a risk of more than three index score, uh, there is seen that 5.4% risk of major cardiac failure. Certain guidelines have been uh, come up for evaluation and management by 2014 AACC guidelines and also Canadian cardiovascular guidelines have been uh, implicated on how to perioperatively risk stratify and manage these cases. In our institute here, we mainly use Canadian cardiovascular guidelines, which first assesses the patient in terms of RCRF, that is Revised Cardiac Risk Index. And according to the risk score, if at all RCRI is more than one or with a age, with a patient with age of 45 to, excuse me, uh, with patient with age of more than 45 to 60 years of age, they, they ask them to get uh, anti-proBNP or cardiac biomarkers done. And if there's a positive biomarker, it is always advised to monitor these patients post-operatively ICU for next uh, 24 to uh, 40, sorry, next 48 to 72 hours with serial ACG and troponin levels. It is also advised to do the same for the patient who have come up for emergency or semi-urgent procedures. So how will you uh, evaluate the patient who has come for uh, chemotherapy for uh, surgeries? So first, we need to take a detailed drug regimen and drug history has to be taken. When was the last chemotherapy received? Uh, and what were the drugs used for chemotherapy? A 12 lead ECG to help us to evaluate if at all in the presence of arrhythmias or QT prolongation. A 2D EPO to evaluate the left ventricular ejection fraction. MRI can also be done, but has a limitations of high cost. And cardio, bi cardiac biomarkers such as anti pro BNP and TROP are very helpful. So it, in the study done by Marco Cicelli that was uh, uh, published in 2017, it has shown that a conjunction of the use of a 2D EPO with cardiac biomarkers together will help us to evaluate a patient uh, with 
even asymptomatic cardiac failure in the initial phases and then it hence help us optimizing further. So when this patient is posted for surgery, we can actually stratify in terms of the emergency of the procedure. If the procedure is emergency and we couldn't do good cardiac risk assessment, it is better to manage them a higher, as a high-risk procedure. But if we, it is not an elect, uh, emergency procedure, but an elective, we can uh, stratify, uh, we can check for the, uh, we should get a good cardiac assessment and evaluate the patient for a heart failure or at all heart failure, which is symptomatic, or if it, there is a systolic dysfunction or if there's a QT prolongation. A patient with heart failure, it, studies have shown that prophylactic treatment with enalapril with an early increase of drop eye levels is very effective in reducing the incidence of left ventricular dysfunction. These are basically the ACE inhibitors that we can start preoperatively with conjunction with beta blockers, that is carvedilol, which is a non-selective beta blocker with a vasodilator and a bisoprolol, that is a uh, beta-1 selective beta blocker. They can be used in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If at all there is a systolic dysfunction present and the patient is posted for high-risk surgery, then we should again start them on ACE inhibitors and go uh, ahead with the management. But if at all it is not a high-risk procedure, we should still get a good exercise testing done, check for the biomarkers, and then proceed for the surgery. Patients with QT prolongation preoperatively, we should check for electrolytes and also current. What? Uh, how can we manage a specific preoperative cardiovascular condition? Firstly, hypertension. It is advised that a stage three hypertension with a blood pressure of more than one eighty by one hundred and ten should be controlled prior to the surgery. Secondary causes should also be evaluated for the hypertension if at all to the stage three, which is very common with pheochromocytoma. If these patients are posted for surgery, we should, the optimization starts 14, 7 to 14 days prior to the surgery if it is a catecholamine secreting tumor. We start with alpha blockade, which is titrated according to the blood pressure. After alpha blockade, the beta blockade can be started. If we can use a cardio selective beta blocker, we should never start a beta blockade prior to the alpha blockade because this will lead to unopposed alpha action and then it will further precipitate the hypertension. If the blood pressure is not controlled with both alpha and beta blockade, we can further uh, start them on calcium channel blockers. The optimization can be assessed in, with help of Roizen's criteria. Uh, further talking about valvular heart diseases, which is again very common with patients who receive radiation therapy. Symptomatic, uh, which is, uh, symptomatic regurgitant valve disease is better tolerated, whereas symptomatic Stenotic lesions have higher risk of perioperative heart failure. So these patients might require percutaneous valvotomy or valve replacement. 2022 European Society of uh, Cardiology guidelines give the, uh, they basically mention specifically for coronary artery disease. It is, uh, it is said that the time-sensitive non-cardiac surgeries after elective PCI, if it is performed, it should be delayed for at least one month of use of dual antiplatelet therapy. But for patients who have received a recent PCI treatment for a symptomatic disease, that is acute coronary syndrome, who require these procedures, an uninterrupted dual antiplatelet therapy should be taken at least for three months. If we have to stop clopidogrel, we should go ahead with bridging. Arrhythmias, as I've already spoken, uh, chemotherapeutic drugs have implications with duty prolongation. Also, we see a lot of metabolic abnormality in these patients, dyselectrolytemia. So we should correct the correctable, uh, correct all the electrolyte abnormalities, assess them prior to the procedure. Carotid artery disease is again something specifically seen in patients who have undergone radiation therapy for the neck. So that so there should be a documentation documentation for a recent carotid ultrasound for patients who have received these uh, radiation to the neck because the incidence is very high. So common perioperative medications such as beta blockers should be should not be withdrawn for a patient who's been chronically on beta blockade. Uh, it should not, but it should never be started on the day of the surgery. Statin should be continued and it should be started for patients undergoing vascular surgeries. ACE inhibitors are usually with her 24 hours prior to the surgery to avoid uh, hypotension, and it's, but it should be restarted as soon as possible. Aspirin is continued up to 24 hours prior to the surgery, and clopidogrel should be with her at least five days prior to the surgery. 
These were taken up from 2014 ABCC guidelines. Talking about respiratory system, um, we all know that the, uh, most of the cancer patients have a post with post-operative pulmonary complications. So we need to do a meticulous preoperative workup on these patients and also optimization becomes very important. Otherwise, there will be prolonged hospital stay, which will tend to increase the morbidity and mortality. What makes our oncological patients uh, procedures that patients undergo high risk for post-operative pulmonary complications? It can be divided into patient-related factors, procedural factors, and laboratory. Patient-related factors mainly being advanced stage elderly, as we've already discussed, uh, AAC physical status of more than two patients uh, being chronic, uh, functionally dependent with chronic obstructive disorders, weight loss, which is again commonly seen with cancer patients, and lifestyle disorders such as cigarette and alcohol use. Also, coming to the procedural uh, risk factors, we see uh, most of the, these oncological procedures being thoracic procedures, abdominal procedures, upper abdominal surgeries, and head and neck procedures. There is a risk assessment score given by ARISCAT that will help us to assess if the patient is high risk for a, a pulmonary complication, which has different components of age, preoperative oxygen saturation, respiratory in infection in prior month that also checks for preoperative anemia, surgical incisions, where the location is, duration of the surgery, and emergency procedures. A, risk, a score of more than 42 makes them high risk, and also most of our procedures come under intermediate to high risk. Chemotherapy has an implication again with lungs, which can be either due to the direct drug toxicity, which can be seen with drugs such as bleomycin, which can be uh, vary from pneumonitis to diffuse alveolar damage and lung fibrosis. Other drugs implicated being methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, mitomycin C. Complications can also be seen secondarily due to the drug-induced immunosuppression. Coming to the radiation as a component of the chemo uh, cancer management, 5 to 25% of patients who have been treated for thoracic or mediastinal malignancies, including esophagus or cases with lung, they tend to have his, uh, radiation induced lung injury, of which 1 to 5% are seen with patients with breast cancer. This radiation induced lung injury can vary from days. And it can also manifest from months to years, starting as either just an interstitial edema, going to pneumonitis, and further causing lung fibrosis. So how will you evaluate these patients? We should ask for a detailed history, symptomatology. We can ask for modified MRC dyspnea scale and then assess for the dyspnea on these patients. Physical examination, baseline saturations, bedside pulmonary function tests, also PFTs assessing for a restrictor and obstructive pattern, and assess for images with chest X ray and HRCP. Principles of optimization for these patients tend to simil be similar for patients coming for both oncological and non oncological procedures. We can remember it with a mnemonic saline. Where first we speak about smoking cessation, airway dilations, loosening of secretions, infection control, nutrition, and education. Smoking cessation, as we all know, is the single most important risk factor that can reduce post-operative pulmonary complication. We have a timeline that is usually discussed in all the books, so I'm not going further. It is shown that three to four weeks of reduction of uh, cessation of smoking can reduce post-operative pulmonary complication by 14 to 21 weeks. Surgery should be taken as a teachable moment where we are encouraging patients to uh, stop smoking and also continue that further. As an anesthesiologist, we should ask for it, advise them to stop smoking and also connect them if they need any help of a psychologist to stop. We can also start them on pharmacotherapy in form of nicotine replacement therapy, psychotropics, and nicotine receptor agonists. Nicotine replacement therapy comes in form of nicotine patches, which come in multiples of 7, 7, 14 mg, and 21 mg. We can ask how many cigarettes a patient smokes per day. If it is more than 10, it is always advised to start them on 21 mg 
which has to be changed every 24 hourly. And it is also better that if we start it prior for the cessation of smoking, as that will reduce the uh, withdrawal symptoms. Other psychotropic agents that can be used as bupropion and partial nicotine receptor agonists, that is valid. Talking about airway dilation, we should know how the bronchomotor tone is controlled. A bronchomotor tone is mainly controlled by both sympathetic system and parasympathetic system. A sympathetic system cause, causes bronchodilatation and reduces mucus secretion, whereas a parasympathetic tone increases the airway caliber, so hence uh, so decreases the airway caliber, causing bronchoconstriction and also imposes increase in the mucus secretion. So use of sympathomimetics, that is beta-2 agonists, will help us in reducing the secretion and airway dilatation. And also use of anti muscarinic agents will also be helpful in these patients. Leukotin receptor antagonists, that is Montelukas, is again something very commonly that we use in our institution here, that is helps with dilatation. When these patients come, getting a pulmonary function test and assessing for reversibility is very uh, helpful. A reversibility is basically, if at all, there is increase in SVC by 10% FEV1 by 200 ml or 12% or FEF 25 to 75, that is mid airway, of more than 20%. So if at all, there is two out of three of these measurements improve, then there is said to be reversibility. And these patients are someone who will have a beneficial effects when we are starting them on bronchodilators. So if the patient is coming in preoperative evaluation, how should we preoperatively evaluate? We can, a patient is a known COPD or asthma. If, we, uh, no, uh, if there is history present, we can assess for a PFP, check for if at all there is an, how are the values of FEV1. If it is an elective procedure with FEV1 less than 1.2, we should counsel the patient and also see if at all there is a possibility of using general anesthesia for that particular procedure. But if the PFT values are good and it's an elective procedure, we can uh, proceed for the surgery, continue them on inhalers, um, and we can go ahead with uh, good pre-optimization, as I've mentioned, and consider pre-operative inspiratory muscle training, which I will be discussing further. According to the Global Strategy of Prevention, Diagnosis, and Management of COPD 2022 guidelines, for a COPD patient, it is advised to spirometrically confirm the diagnosis, assess for limitation, and also ask for a history of exacerbation. We can also further stratify the patient according to the gold criteria into gold one, two, three, four, according to the FEV1 value. And then uh, according to the symptoms and COPD assessment test, that can be a questionnaire that is given to the patient and dyspnea scale, we tend to categorize them into group A, B, C, and D. A patient using in group A, we can just start them on a bronchodilator therapy, the short-acting beta agonist, and patient with severe disease who come under group D, we should, it is advised to start them on long-acting beta agonist, long-acting, uh, and also inhale corticosteroids. Coming to restrictive lung disorder, as I've already mentioned, it is something we commonly see with, uh, see with uh, uh, oncological treatment. So radiation-induced lung injury, we can uh, it is used, these patients are usually on inhaled steroids, oral and IV steroids. So for the procedures, we should uh, assess for the uh, giving them a stress dose of steroids. They can also be uh, on cyclosporin as that's high. Chemotherapy lung induced is mainly seen with bleomycin. So we should target the oxygen exposure in such a way that the saturation of 88 to 92 is measured. And also intraoperatively, ventilator strategies uh, should be very carefully maintained and we should use a lower limit of oxygen or FiO2 of 0.3% is advised. Talking about saline and loosening of secretion, adequate hydration and postural drainage is very important. We can also use mucoactive drain, uh, active agents. Uh, taking the help of respiratory physician here uh, or a, a physiotherapist will be very helpful in these situations. Infection control. Uh, is again a very important component. So if the patient is having a history of productive cuffs, putter should be sent for culture sensitivity, sensitivity and appropriate antibiotics should be started in them. Nutrition is one of the important factors that has already been discussed, so I'm not going into deep, but nutritional optimization is also very important. Coming to education and motivation. 
what we are doing here is advising the patient to start on incentive spirometer incentive spirometry is basically attempt to mimic a yawn or a sigh and incentive spirometry uh, devices are basically visual positive feedback devices which will tell the patient a predetermined volume or a rate to be achieved and that should be held minimum of 3 seconds there are different spirometers available that is flow oriented spirometers which consists of three chambers and volume oriented spirometer which is a compact device of 4000 ml capacity and has one way valve that prevents exhalation into the urine so there is a sliding pointer which will help us to reach the pre uh, described inspiratory level in the institution here we mainly prefer volume oriented incentive spirometer because studies that have been recently published from manipal by gopal krishna sir it mainly shows that diaphragmatic breathing exercises and volume oriented spirometer have better results compared to that of the flow oriented spirometer so it is advised to start in any patients going for thoracic surgery for upper abdominal surgeries coming to hematological system as we all know uh, it's um, cancer chemotherapy tends to cause bone marrow suppression cancer tends to affect the hematopoietic system in several ways that also has an implication because of the chemotherapy radiation and these patients also tend to come for bone marrow history of bone marrow transplantation so when these patients these complications are observed there is a higher risk for infection bleeding and other health issues anemia is seen in 60 or uh, most of the patient and it tends to uh, increase the mortality of over 65% anemia is mainly seen either due to frank blood loss that is a surgery or due to the coagulopathy or due to a bleeding tumor it could be either due to nutritional deficiencies due to the appetite suppression of the chemotherapy it can also be due to the inflammation that can be uh, which causes increase up regulation of hepcidin that again blocks the absorption of the iodine uh, iron causing functional iron deficiency we can assess the patient if the patient has a hemoglobin to 8 to 12 i uh, giving iv iron is has shown a lot of benefit we can start the patient on uh, a lot of iv iron therapies are available but using ferric carboxy maltose is newly available and it is uh, has good uh, advantages we can give it at a maximum infusion rate of 20 mg per kg um, and in a time duration of 15 to 20 minutes where the iod uh, ferritin levels go up in 9 7 to 9 days and help hence helping us with optimization neutropenia is again something that is seen which is typically occurs 6 to 10 days following the chemotherapy uh, administration but they tend to recover within 2 to 3 according to national uh, cancer institute toxicity neutropenia is defined as uh, um, absolute neutrophil count of less than 500 uh, cells per millimeter square so it, they grade it into 0 to 4 uh, grade 4 being very severe so is there a cut off for surgeries uh, there is one study that shows that an absolute neutrophil count of more than 1000 can be taken uh, for minimum for patient undergoing a limb salvage surgery after receiving chemotherapy it is in institution here we use a cut off of 1500 as a anc count of less than 1500 has a higher risk of febrile neutropenia so if the patient do come with uh, neutropenia we can start them on uh, uh, granulocyte colony stimulating factors and it usually takes about 6 uh, 5 to Three to six days for the uh, counts to occur. Thrombocytopenia is mainly defined as a platelet count of less than uh, one lakh, uh, which can again be graded in from grade one to four. With grade four being very severe thrombocytopenia of less than twenty five thousand. What are the anesthetic implications? So, if we are going ahead with procedure, we need an absolute platelet count for a central venous line being about uh, and uh, bone marrow procedures being more than twenty to thirty thousand. For lumbar pro uh, procedures and surface surgical procedures, account more than fifty thousand. Uh, for major surgeries and uh, and surgeries in the closed cavity, it is advised to have a count of more than seventy five to one lakh. And central neuraxial blockade is advised if there is a count of more than seventy five to eighty thousand peripheral nerve block. Of Fifty thousand. So, if these patients come with thrombocytopenia, we can start them on thrombiplastin. 
which is basically a thrombopoietin receptor agonist, we can also go ahead with platelet transfusion with either random donor platelets or single donor platelets. Coagula uh, we, coagulation abnormalities is something very commonly seen because cancer is a hypercoagulable state due to the increase in various plasma levels of clotting factors, cytokine, uh, cancer pro uh, cytokines, and cancer procoagulants. The hypercoagulability can lead to uh, arterial uh, thrombi, that is myocardial infarction, stroke, and venous thrombus. So different cancers tend to have higher risk factors, that is pancreatic cancer posing the highest factor. We should also remember that the uh, implications of the treatment can also also make these uh, so, uh, procedures uh, hypercoagulable. So we can, uh, for a surgical risk, a preni risk assessment model is used for a risk uh, where we give points to, according to the different uh, components and the risk of uh, zero to four is a low risk and a score of more than high being the high risk. So if the patient comes with high risk, we can start them on preoperatively low molecular weight repairing with compressive stockings. So if these patients already have a history of DVP, they do come with uh, taking uh, oral anticoagulants such as warfarin or other newer anticoagulant agents. So if the patient comes with warfarin, it is better to discontinue five days before an elective procedure and check for the INR one to two days prior to the surgery taken up from ASRA guidelines 2018. And if the INR is still high, we can ask the patient to start either on oral or IV vitamin K. If the, we can also bridge the patient from warfarin to low molecular weight heparin. And if the patient is receiving low molecular weight heparin, last dose should be 24 hours prior uh, and it should be half the daily dose. Endocrine system, diabetes is a metabolic disorder. It is again very common in the patients who come uh, for procedures due to the lifestyle disorders. It is advised to have a perioperative uh, blood glucose of 80 to 180 milligram per deciliter. And uh, we also see that steroids are most commonly used in our cancer patients as a pre-medication even to avoid uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. So if the steroids are used, these patients with subclinical diabetes tend to have frank blood sugars and high. So these patients should be evaluated, or evaluated on the basis of the blood sugars, past three months control with HbA1c, cardiac evaluation with velvet ECG, 2D or serum creatinine. Perioperatively, certain medications should be stopped and continue to avoid uh, complications. So metformin, that is something that we see very commonly. It is advised that if it is a, for a very uh, minimally invasive surgery, we can continue. But for a major surgery, it is avoid, better to avoid metformin at least 28 to 48, uh, 24 to 48 hours to avoid a renal hypoperfusion, metabolic acidosis and lactic acidosis. Uh, we can also convert these patients if they are admitted prior to the surgery to uh, insulin. That is, uh, we can check insulin more uh, in a frequent intervals and give uh, the levels accord. Check for blood sugars in more frequent intervals and give insulin accord. Adrenal insufficiency, as I've already mentioned, it is again seen because these patients can be on chronic glucocorticoid treatments as it is seen with patients on radiation-induced lung injuries. They can also be due to the metastatic diseases to adrenal glands and due to the immunotherapy that patients receive. So if the patient is posted for procedures according to the type of procedure, if it is a minor, moderate, or a major procedure, a stress dose of glucocorticoids should be given prior and should also be continued according to the guidelines for the next 24 to 48 hour period. Most common disorders, again, when it comes to endocrine, we see is hypothyroidism. That is mainly due to the radiation to the neck or the nearby region, or patient having a history of thyroidectomy who have used radio, radio iodine treatment and use of oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are basically sudetimib, surafinib, and all. These are used for hepatocellular carcinomas, renal cell carcinomas, and GIST and immunotherapy. So when the patient is coming for management, we should stratify according if it's an elective surgery or an urgent or an emergency surgery and accordingly taken up for the surgery. If mild to moderate, it, should, it is better to postpone the until new thyroid. Usually we consider uh, TSH levels of less than 10 for the surgery, so it is better to postpone until it is that. But if it is an urgent procedure, we should just start them on oral therapies um, and proceed with a moderate risk. But if it is a severe hypothyroidism, we should always have an endocrinologist in the loop 
and um, help them with IV thyroid hormone and go for a stress dose of steroid also for an emergent or uh, urgent procedure. Carcinoid syndrome are mainly seen with neuroendocrine tumors. And the crisis can be precipitated when the patient is undergoing surgery, tumor handling, or biopsy. A detailed cardiac assessment on these patients has to be done because 50% of these cases tend to have cardiac involvement. And carcinomas are most carcinoids are most commonly seen with GI and bronchopulmonary system. So starting them on a prophylactic or an intraoperative octreotide, if it is a secreting tumor, that is, if there's an elevated 5-hydroxy uh, indole acetoacetate is there, it is better to start these patients on prophylactic octreotide therapy. But if it is a non-secreting tumor, it is not at least. Uh, coming to the renal system optimization, uh, renal system is, has multiple hits on the, in the cancer treatment and these patients. Nephrotoxicity is very common, mainly again due to the chemotherapeutic agents. These patients tend to have prior history of AKI, it could be there. There could be a reduction of kidney mass because these patients could have already gone through some nephrectomy in renal cell carcinoma or urothelial tumors. There could be an obstructive uropathy in these patients. There could be kidney irradiation and pelvic tumors and nephrotoxic agents. Nephrotoxic agents tend to mainly manifest in form of acute tubular injury. So they mainly have AKI and different electrolytes, diselectrolytemia. So that has to be optimized prior to the procedure. It is seen that a patient who is undergoing nephrectomy for a localized RC, uh, renal cell carcinoma, approximately 20 to 30 percent have a pre component of pre existing CKD. So this is something that has to be kept in mind when we are taking them up for the procedure. Finally, speaking about the electrolyte abnormalities, uh, as I, the electrolyte abnormalities that mainly that we see being hyponatremia, which could be a pa uh, paraneoplastic syndromes are manifested that can be seen with SIADH. These are mainly seen with lung carcinomas. It can also, it is present due to the chronic disease status. So we need to identify the cause and appropriate correction has to be employed. I am not discussing on how to optimize because it is beyond this uh, presentation. Hypercalcemia is also something that is commonly seen. It could be seen with parathyroid tumors. It could also be seen with um, patients with lung carcinoma. So that has to be screening should be done and appropriate manage should be, management should be employ, employed in form of aggressive IV hydration. We, if there's a volume overload, we can go ahead with loop diuretics. We can also consider IV dispo. Hypophosphatemia is something that should be addressed, also checked for the patients because it could be due to the critical illness, nutritional status due to the malnutrition type of the cancer. It is also seen with patients who are on platin-based drugs and also as a uh, component of paraneoplastic syndrome, that is a Falconi syndrome. So when we are uh, optimizing for the phosphate repletion, we can uh, check accord. We can do that according to the phosphate phosphorus levels of the patient. Which, if at all it is less than one, initial IV management can be used. One to one point seven, we can go for either IV or per oral if the patient is tolerating enteral feeds. And one point eight to two, you can go ahead with oral management. So uh, to conclude this class. Uh, Cancer patients, as I've already mentioned, are unique challenges. Optimization should be a balance of assessment of a risk-benefit ratio, so as to have an overall benefit in the perioperative outcome. Uh, if and we should also assess them according to the uh, urgency of the surgery and when the procedure has to be taken. I have covered the topic in very briefly because. If there are more aspects that can be covered, but it could be beyond the class. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savya. Um, yes, I completely agree with Dr. Savya that the topic is uh, very vast and not possible to cover. Basically, the principles behind preoperative evaluation and optimization are quite similar, as I said, to those coming uh, for non-cancer surgeries. Uh, other than whatever has been discussed. So if there are any questions, I would really want you all to type in your questions in the Q&A box or chat box, whatever is 
uh, accessible to you and we'll take uh, the questions for answering. One point that I wanted to highlight is um, unlike um, other procedures or other patients where uh, a 12 lead ECG or a 2D echo is considered unnecessary, in cancer patients, particularly those who've received chemotherapy, it is important that you get a 12 lead ECG and an echo done. And based on that is where you would do your evaluation. And as Dr. Stavia mentioned that we've been doing the uh, NT-Pro BNP and Prop I in high-risk patients, patients who have uh, low effort tolerance, less than four mets, to be able to risk stratify them. And we also repeat them in the post-operative period to identify if they have developed any early cardiovascular complications. Another thing that I wanted to mention was the dilemma. Dilemma of a patient testing positive on a TMT. So what if a patient coming for a major abdominal surgery tests positive on stress test? Do you want to go ahead with coronary angiography? Do you want to go ahead with stenting and uh, revascularization procedures like CABG? So what is the risk benefit of getting this done before the patient undergoes major oncosurgery? So uh, though I think this question could vary with different types of patients as well as the type of surgery that patient is coming for as well as the backup that you have in your hospital but a recent study shows that revascularizing a patient just for the sake of major surgery uh, including oncosurgeries may actually be unnecessary and in the two groups that they compared one where they actually uh, had patient undergo uh, either uh, percutaneous coronary intervention or CABG and the other group where they went for surgery upfront, there wasn't much difference in the morbidity as well as mortality. So that could be one important take home. Also, the fact that if patients who undergo stenting, like Dr. Sravya mentioned, that they need to be on dual antiplatelet drugs and that time that you compulsorily need to continue them could vary from one month to three months at least. So that also needs consideration when you take this decision. I see a couple of questions popping in and I'm going to start taking them. So um, Sravya, there's a question which says in the preoperative clinic, uh, okay, we see a high-risk cardiac patient, cardiomyopathy or arrhythmia. So it's the anesthesiologist as perioperative physician who is supposed to optimize the patient or should we refer the patient to physician or cardiologist? Thank you, Dr. Raki, for this. Stravya, do you want to take this? Um, yes, ma'am. So in our setup here, we don't have a 24-hour cardiac backup. So we do refer the patient to the cardiologist who help us to optimize the patient. But it is us as a perioperative physician who should also know how to manage these cases intraoperatively and also what medications should be started that would help us with further going ahead with the procedure. So it is more like a multidisciplinary uh, approach towards it where we should have a cardiologist involved, yes, but we should also be a primary physician who knows how to optimize these cases. That yeah, I would concur way. with uh, Dr. Stravya because we are a standalone cancer center. Uh, that's why I think it is important that we need to know how to uh, take care of these patients in an emergency and we also refer them if they have severe cardiac disease so that they can come and either transfer the patient to their hospital or come and suggest management, which can be continued in our hospital. But I think it would vary from setup to setup. There's another question, uh, Dr. Sravya. What is the role of serum albumin? Uh, you've skipped nutrition, but what is the role, do you think, of serum albumin in the nutritional optimization of this patient? And for which patients would we prefer TPN initiation prior to surgery. So serum albumin again plays a very important role. I've already mentioned in uh, post-operative pulmonary complications also, if we see the laboratory uh, risk assessment, an albumin of less than three patients have a higher risk of post-operative pulmonary complication. It is also a marker for the nutritional status of the patient, usually the half-life of albumin being about 21 days, so it will 
give us an idea about the perioperative nutrition. Initiation of TPN is usually not recommended. The studies do not show for any uh, that would recommend towards initiation of TPN. So if at all the patient can take enteral feeding, it is always advised to have an oral high protein diet or an enteral feed. But if the patient is not tolerating an oral or an enteral feed for at least seven to 10 days preoperatively and is having uh, symptoms of cancer, cachexia or something, at those patients, we could start them, but I would still recommend on an oral or an enteral feed. Like emphasis is always on the oral feeds compared to that on total parenteral. Yeah, let me just add in a little more to what Dr. Sravya said. So first and foremost, serum albumin is just a prognostic marker. I mean, if you think you're going to start nutritionally optimizing a patient and see rise in serum albumin, I don't think that's the right way to do things. It's a prognostic marker that talks about post-operative morbidity, mortality, and other complications that she spoke about. Having said that, anyone whose serum albumin is less than 3.5, or more so, less than three. If they are coming for major surgeries, you definitely have to optimize these patients nutritionally. So Dr. Savya mentioned if oral route is available, oral, if not enteral, and if both are not available and they are coming for major surgeries. So there are some studies that have uh, seen the, that have checked for the benefit of total parenteral nutrition before surgeries like say Whipple surgeries or even esophageal surgeries to see if they benefit the outcomes. So there isn't much benefit in using uh, total parenteral nutrition before surgery, though a subgroup analysis showed that those patients uh, whose serum albumin was less than three and those who were sarcopenic actually benefited from this intervention. So again, um, it should not be a routine protocol to use TPN to optimize nutrition before major surgery, but you may use it uh, selectively in certain patient population. We'll move on to the next one, uh, Dr. Sravya. Are you advising iron therapy yourself or referring to the physicians? So let me just uh, take this. We have started iron therapy recently, but we haven't yet implemented our protocol. We are actually trying to do it um, ourselves, like the um, surgeons and the anesthesia team together. And we are uh, trying to see how best we can use it. But it's being used in our hospital and mostly the medical oncologists are using it. Uh, for the patients that come to them for uh, chemotherapy, in between the chemotherapy. Um, there's one more question, Dr. Sravya. Let me know the calcium correction for hypocalcemia and cancers we come across. Uh, post-operative cases of carcinoma where it's more common. Okay, so I think what they are trying to ask is that, but this is about post-op, for patients where we, anticipate post-operative hypocalcemia, whether we correct it pre-operatively. I'm not very sure if that is the question because <laughs> the topic is pre-operative optimization. And if that is the question, then the answer is no, because this often happens in uh, parathyroid malignancies and where actually the calcium levels are going to be high. But what if, uh, Dr. Sravya, patient's calcium is low pre-operatively? What would you do? We could start, we could get, uh, so it could be, if at all it is present, it could be there in lung malignancies, hypocalcemia could be seen. Preoperatively, we could start them on oral calcium replacement in terms of root cal and vitamin D also should be corrected in conjunction with it. Uh, sure. So actually, yeah. hypercalcemia is actually common with malignancy. Hypocalcemia, you may get to see in nutritionally depleted patients, right? So I think along with calcium, checking phosphate is very important for patients who've not been feeding appropriately and adequately before surgery. And if they are low, we can correct them. Uh, any lower cutoff limit of TSH for semi-elective surgery in hyperthyroid patient? So the patient is hyperthyroid. Uh, what TSH 
Uh, I think more than the TSH, you need to see if the hyperthyroid status is being corrected uh, by antithyroid drugs and use of beta blockers to correct the heart rate. I think this would be more important. Uh, also asking for T3 and T4 levels, uh, more than really looking at the uh, TSH levels. We have a very esteemed uh, senior anesthesiologist also in this panel, uh, our president, Dr. Jyotsna, uh, Dr. Anjali, uh, Dr. Sohan. And I would really want uh, any of you who differ with whatever we've been saying so far to please chip in and uh, add to the conversation. Uh, I'll just move on to the next question because I see a couple of questions and we are uh, close to seven now. Uh, what should be the first line antihypertensive? We should start when we see hypertension diagnosed for the first time in PSC clinic, which is actually very common, uh, Dr. Stavya, and should we refer it to a physician for the same? So again, hypertension can be optimized by uh, as, as a perioperative physician. So we, I would not say that we would specifically need to uh, refer the patient to a physician. We can, if it is a, hypertension of about 160 by 90 mmHg, we can start them with a low dose of calcium channel blockers that would always help. But if we do have good amount of time from the time of the diagnosis to the surgery, we can always start them on ACE inhibitors also. But we should be very careful that we need to stop them preoperatively and then uh, at least 24 hours and then go for the procedure. So accordingly there's no first line but we could start with a calcium channel blocker if at all and then slowly up uh, increase the dosage or change the medication is what i mean yeah treatment would be quite similar to the um, hypertension uh, guidelines treatment guidelines and uh, ace inhibitor can be useful particularly if the patient is diabetic uh, it will also be protective, cardioprotective as well as nephroprotective in that situation. Uh, but most commonly, we try and start uh, calcium channel blockers because like Dr. Stravia said, that uh, we can uh, continue them till the day of surgery. And uh, because if you are giving ACE inhibitors, then you will have to skip it on the day of surgery. And sometimes on the day of surgery, uh, we would often see a very high blood pressure, which again, after induction is going to dip down a lot. So there could be more fluctuations. So personally, in our institute, we prefer to start uh, calcium channel blockers. Sorry. Uh, is there a role of PFT, Dr. Stavia, in non-COPD or non-asthmatic patients? Yes, there is a role of PFT in a patient who is non-COPD or asthmatic. If the patient is posted for any thoracic malignancy, it will help us to prehabilitate the patient better, start them on medications accordingly, and also it can act as a reference point. PFTs also have a good role in patients who are posted for upper abdominal surgeries where, or a cytoreductive procedures where the diaphragm is uh, handled and that could also something that would implicate in post-operative pulmonary complications. So it would just give us a baseline on if at all how vigorous we should be with them for the optimization so that we would reduce the complications. So there is a role of PFTs in a non-COPD and non asthmatic Yeah, they would help us risk stratify and also I wanted to add patients who've received chest radiation uh, more than 20 grays uh, you can get a PFT uh, done to see if uh, they are having restrictive lung disease because uh, like Dr. Stravya showed that pulmonary fibrosis could be uh, one of the complications of uh, chest radiation. Uh, when it comes to optimization and risk stratification, how important is it to consider frailty? Frailty, yeah, you didn't cover frailty, Dr. Stravya. Uh, frailty is basically is very important to consider in these patients because patients who are frail is basically means that they have reduced cardiac reserves at the same time reduced uh, pulmonary reserves also. So a patient who's frail, we should uh, optimization comes in form in them. The optimization should be more in terms of pulmonary prehabilitation at the same time good nutritional support to be given has to be given to these patients in form of high protein diet because that will help us to get better overall outcomes after the surgery and better rehabilitation also after procedure. 
Yeah, so I think frailty is a very, very important uh, comorbidity, actually. And uh, the reason to actually allow more time for prehabilitation, frailty is one of the important reasons because improving uh, the uh, functional status of the patient is actually going to improve the outcome. Um, that reminds me uh, about obesity, Dr. Savya, because also obesity is another situation where, uh, which is not very uncommon in cancer, in breast cancers, endometrial cancers, we often see obese patients. Do you want to quickly talk about it? So if the patient comes with obesity, that is, we have to see what is the BMI. If the BMI is more than 30 or 35, we should always ask for a history. We should ask for the uh, stop bank questionnaire and assist risk stratification is done accordingly. We should uh, see if the patient is at a higher risk of OSA or there is a component of hypercapnia by assessing for the ABGs in them and then going ahead. So, so stratification and investigation on these of these patients also depends upon what type of procedures are these patients posted for. If it's a major abdominal surgery, we could actually see that there are a lot of uh, studies that do show that there could be a beneficial aspect to, of doing a sleep study on them and assessing for the apnea, hypoapnea index and also starting them preoperatively and also continuing postoperatively the CPAP uh, could also actually help us in reducing the overall postoperative pulmonary complications. So the stratification is again always based upon the type of the surgery that the patient is posting. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Stravia. That's yet another thing that we've been practicing in our hospital. Uh, patients who have a uh, stop bank score more than four by five, we've been getting sleep studies on them and advising them auto CPAP if they have, definitely if they have severe uh, AHI index, which is more than 30 and moderate AHI uh, between 15 to 30 also are advised if they're coming for major surgeries. Um, I think we are closing to time, but I have a couple of questions and I'm going to go ahead and answer them myself in the interest of time. So for chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, which drugs would we prefer? And for how many days would we postpone an elective surgery? Okay, so uh, let me just give you an example and uh, see if it uh, resonates to what is going on in your mind. So if there is a patient who has undergone, say, uh, breast neoadjuvant chemotherapy and comes to us uh, with an ejection fraction of, say, 40%, so how are we going to optimize this patient and how long do we need to delay her surgery? So uh, as Dr. Savya mentioned that we would put this patient on uh, an ACE inhibitor along with a beta blocker, usually either carvedlol or bisoprolol. And we would optimize, we would ask her to take this medication at least for a week and ideally for 10 days. And then we get a repeat echo done. And for most instances, we've seen at least a 5% improvement from the baseline echo status. We may not really get to wait for long, depending upon uh, what is the last time, uh, last uh, chemo time duration, because we need to make sure that four to six weeks max is what is allowed. And we often do not get to see the patient immediately after the chemo is over. The, key, the patient after taking chemo usually comes to the surgical side after three to four weeks. So we would probably have only two to three weeks in hand, which we can utilize to optimize this patient. And then we would risk, we would explain the risks uh, to the patient and the family and take this patient for surgery. Uh, irrespective of uh, whether it reaches in the normal range or no. For patients who are on antihypertensives like ARBs, should it be avoided on the morning of surgery or it can be continued uh, according to the recent guidelines? So uh, I think our experience with using ARBs and ACE inhibitors on the morning of surgery, particularly for moderate and high-risk surgeries, is not very good because uh, the pressures can drop precipitously. Uh, patients who are coming for minor procedures, say uh, just biopsies under anesthesia, um, you may allow them to take. But as I said, that if you're anticipating hemodynamic fluctuations, they could get aggravated if they are continued. And it is probably okay not to give them on the day of surgery and restart them, like Dr. Savya mentioned, restart them as early as possible in the postoperative period. 
how common is iva bradine used for heart rate control post chemotherapy in other institutes it's our cardiologist favorite drug yes we also like to use iva bradine but post chemotherapy heart rate uh, tachycardia also could be because of um, early heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and that is one thing that we need to keep in mind and in such situations you would definitely need to give uh, ace inhibitor and um, a cardio selective beta blocker for this patient and if still the heart rate is staying high then you could go ahead and use ivabradine but only using ivabradine i may not be very good idea is what i think yeah so we finished all the questions and um yeah dr sohan dr anjali and dr jyotsna please can i have your comments on today's topic yeah so uh <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Shravya and Dr. Viva. And Dr. Shravya, for a detailed talk on this, um, this great topic. And uh, thank you, Dr. Viva, for explaining each and every question of attendees in detail. And thank you very much. We also learned a lot today. So I think uh, this um, webinar went, uh, really went well. And uh, so I thank you all. Uh, I think we can just uh, finish this talk. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I would like to thank the speaker. Yeah. Shabhai did a very good job. Very you, And I think the discussion was great. And I would also like to thank the audience for being so participative. Yeah. And I would like to second what Vibha said in the beginning. If you haven't become a member of SOPSI, we welcome you. Please become a member of SOPSI. And I think uh, we got a lot out of the discussion, all of us. Dr. Jotsna, any comments? Yes, yes. I, I congratulate. I very good talk by Dr. Sabya and also moderated by Dr. Biva. And I feel this sort of interactive discussion, it should be more and more interactive discussion about, and on this common topic, what we use daily, daily basis, everybody or us is practicing. So it's a really good topic and good discussion. And uh, I feel uh, Biva and Sabha has done a very good job. So we should have more discussion next in future. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the audience who really uh, made this session very interactive. Please thank become you. SOPSI members. Yes, <laughs> please become SOPSI members. And many thanks to ClearNet as well. I think the platform is doing very well for the yeah. last yeah. session. Yeah. Yeah, so it is I working well now. Dinner, so we can stop this session over here. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing such valuable insights. We are most grateful to everyone present here. We hope to have, have you again on our platform very soon for next session. So, with all your permission, I would like to sign off for today. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am.